Las Vegas. It's more than just a city. It's a feeling. It's that feeling of excitement when you spot the lights of the strip out the airplane window. It's that feeling of awe as you stroll down the boulevard, taking in the sights and sounds. And it's that feeling of satisfaction knowing that you're in the greatest city in the world. Over 42 million people from around the world share that feeling every year. And I'm one of them. Taking you to the world-famous Vegas Strip and beyond, my name is Jeff, and this is Jeff Does Vegas. The history of Las Vegas is jammed full of so many great stories about the mob and their involvement in the development of the city. And for this episode of the podcast, we're going to go in depth on one of the ones that you might not be quite so familiar with. Originally hailing from a small town in Texas that doesn't even exist anymore, Benny Binion rose to become a kingpin in the Las Vegas casino scene, creating a legacy that's lasted well beyond his death in the late 1980s. And joining me to talk about it, making his fifth appearance on the podcast, is Jeff Schumacher, Vice President of Exhibits and Programs at the Mob Museum in downtown Las Vegas. Jeff and I talked about what got Benny into gambling initially and his early life of crime, what prompted the move from Texas to Las Vegas, the unique trends that Benny started in the casino business, some of which are still being followed today, and how the Binion name lives on in present day Las Vegas. Please enjoy my conversation with Jeff Schumacher of the Mob Museum. One of the issues with Benny Binion is whether you consider him a mobster or not, uh, you know, a gangster or not. Uh, I think people who who are familiar with him from the 70s and 80s, uh, you know, when he was quite famous, uh, not only in Las Vegas, but really around the world, um, you know, people didn't think of him that way. He was this sort of portly cowboy who ran the Binion's Horseshoe in downtown Las Vegas, which was at the time the home to the World Series of Poker and was a place that was known for, you know, great hospitality and high stakes gambling. And so he was a character in Las Vegas, but he wasn't necessarily seen uh, in the light of the mob or of, of gangsterism. But in fact, <laughs> if you really look into the history of his life, he was very much in the in the mold of a, of a mobster. It's just that he wasn't Italian American. He wasn't Irish. He wasn't uh, Jewish. You know, some of these uh, stereotypes that we familiar that we're familiar with. He came here from you know Texas, and so he wore cowboy hats and boots. And so he didn't look like a gangster. Well, let's drill down into the world of Benny Binion. Let's start off with the early years. Where was home for Benny and and what was his childhood like? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I, I was doing some research on where Benny Binion was born. He was born in 1904 in a little town called Pilot Grove, Texas. It's It's really a tiny little place just north of Dallas. But if you look it up on Google Maps today, it's not there. It's literally not there. Uh, the map takes you to the Pilot Grove Cemetery, which is still there. But the rest of the town is, very, is disappeared, essentially. And this is true of a lot of you know early 20th century towns. They, they lack a reason to exist, and they kind of disappear. And that's what happened with the little town where he grew up. His family uh, was very poor. Uh, when Benny was very young, he was a, a sickly child. He he got pneumonia like a numerous times. He was left him in bed for long periods of time, and his father really questioned whether he was going to survive. You know his youth. Um, his father was a horse trader. Uh, he which meant that he traveled around the state, living out of a wagon, and he had so little like confidence in Benny's like future that he brought him with him. So like five years old, six years old, Benny was traveling around with his father around the state. And um, uh, Doug Swanson, his biographer, described where the, you know his father's life as a world of renegades, grifters, hustlers, and highwaymen. You know, horse trading wasn't exactly the most honorable profession. And, um, and so Benny learned, you know, at his father's feet, like, this is how life is. Uh, Benny didn't go to school much at all. 
uh, he got an education, you know, out there on the highway with his dad. And, uh, and part of that was getting involved in gambling. And, you know, according to, you know, the legend, everybody uh, who was out, you know, the horse traders and all these other hustlers all loved to gamble. And so Benny, when he was hanging out with his dad, would hang would would like, you know, hang around with these gambling types and uh, do favors for them, take care of, you know, things for them. And in the process, he learned the whole gambling game at a very young age. I just picture this little kid, like, like little running around, <laughs> learning, learning about poker and learning about cards and various gambling from, from these really rough tumble cowboy type dudes. And and one of the things they assigned him to do was to go recruit customers for the poker games. So one of the things that would happen with these uh, these rotors, as they were known, uh, these individuals would they would have like kind of like you know festivals or or uh, you know fair fairs where they would all gather in one place, and or the community would gather, you know, like a county fair, and uh, they would stop there, and it was Benny's job to go find customers for the poker games. So he would go look for guys who had a looked like they had money in their pocket, but they didn't really know how to play, <laughs> so they could be fleeced of their money. And uh, Benny apparently became very good at this. Those are the best kind of players that you want when you're organizing a card game, I would imagine. <laughs> we built an entire city on it, man. Believe me. <laughs> and so, other than working as a recruiter for his dad, what were some of Benny's earlier rackets that he got involved in in, in the world of gambling? Yeah, so as, as Benny got a little bit older, got into his teens, um, you know, obviously the stakes grew a little bit for him. And one of the things he did when he was 18, he moved to El Paso in West Texas. Remember, he had been living and grew up in, in North Texas. So he moved to uh, El Paso, and it's there he got involved with smuggling liquor from Mexico. This is during Prohibition, and, um, you know, you would you would get the good liquor from out of, out of the country, right? And so if you're in the Northeast, you might, uh, or the Midwest, you might get it smuggled in from Canada. Well, if you lived in the South, like the, Texas, you would get it smuggled in from Mexico. So uh, Benny got involved with that racket. And uh, it might sound simple that to just, you know, pick up this liquor in Mexico and bring it back to uh, to America, but it wasn't simple at all. The borderlands along that route were full of thieves and hijackers as well as like Texas Rangers and Prohibition agents. There were gunfights, there were hijackings, all kinds of stuff was going on there. And Benny was right in the middle of it. Um, he was arrested uh, and jailed for a prohibition violation when he was in El Paso. Um, eventually, uh, Benny moves back to Dallas and he resumes his bootlegging there. But one of the things that, that Benny talked about, and he he was actually quite open about his early years later on with uh, people who like he did an oral history at, at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He did some other interviews and he was very open about this. And he always said he was really a bad bootlegger, that he, he never made much money uh, in bootlegging. Uh, he also got arrested a number of times, you know, nothing serious, but, you know, for bootlegging, uh, he served very little time in jail, but he, you know, one time he was uh, sentenced to 60 days in jail for carrying a concealed uh, firearm. Um, so it, it, bootlegging kind of from there, he evolved into gambling and gambling was where, you know, Benny really excelled. And he did, I mean, other than just the bootlegging, he ran into other issues in Texas as well, legal problems. He was arrested for uh, a couple of more serious crimes as well. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, one of the things that uh, Benny got involved in as he was growing in the organized crime world was for murder. Um, in 1931, uh, Binion was was working as a bootlegger and he, he confronted a fellow bootlegger, a black man named Frank Bolding, and uh, Binion believed that Bolding was stealing from him. So they went, you know, Benny went and confronted him. The conversation heated up. Uh, Binion pulled a gun and shot Bolding to death. Um, multiple versions of this story came out. Uh, in one version, Bol you know, Binion said that Bolding had pulled a knife on him, 
So he was just defending himself by shooting Bolding. In a second version, Bolding had a knife, but he hadn't pulled it out yet when Benny fired. Uh, in any case, Binion told the police that Bolding had come at him with a knife. Uh, Binion was not arrested or jail, he, but he did end up pleading guilty to murder. Now, you would think, okay, you know, it was he was admitting to uh, having committed this crime, but this was all kind of a ruse. Uh, he, he pled guilty to murder, and he received a two-year suspended sentence. So he, you know, he didn't serve a, a day in jail for that murder. And one of the reasons for that was that Binion was good friends with the district attorney, Bill McCraw. Bill McCraw wanted to run for governor, and it wouldn't look good if he had allowed Binion to escape the charge completely. So he had him plead guilty to murder, but then received no sentence. So <laughs> Binion got out of that one claiming self-defense and being close friends with the DA. Then in 1936, uh, Binion got into another confrontation with a com competitor, a guy named Ben Frieden. And uh, Frieden ran a, at that time, Ben Benny was involved in the policy racket, kind of like what you would call a street lottery, uh, where you would, you know, every day you'd pick the numbers, somebody would come around and take your quarter, from you, usually in the black community or Latino community, people would bet a quarter and they'd say, I want my numbers today are going to be three, two, one. And uh, then every night the, the number would be picked and you would win or lose. Well, this guy, Ben Frieden, ran a competing uh, street lottery with Binion. Uh, so Binion confronted him on the street, much like he had Frank Boulding, and he ended up shooting Frieden three times in the chest. <laughs> you know, Binion turned himself in. But once again, he claimed self-defense. Uh, Benny was indicted, uh, but later the district attorney dropped the charges for lack of evidence. No, There were no witnesses, apparently, even though this happened right on the street uh, in a busy part of town. So you have a situation where, where Binion, you know, he killed two people, admittedly. He admitted shooting them to death uh, and did not serve any time for those for those crimes. And and as you say, I mean, by this point, he was already quite in hard with organized crime. Did he join up with an existing organization for organized crime or or was he sort of striking out on his own or was it a, a combination of the two? I, I would say it was kind of a combination. So one of the things that Benny did is he learned a great deal from a man named Warren Diamond. He, Warren Diamond was kind of known as the gambling kingpin of Dallas. But when, when Diamond died, you know, Binion seized the opportunity and he started moving into greater dominance in the gambling business in, in Dallas. So, as I mentioned, you know, Benny started out in the numbers racket or the policy racket, and uh, it was a gold mine for him. He made a lot of money uh, from the black community through, through the numbers racket. Uh, but then he also got involved with a high-end gambling place called the Topo Hill Terrace. And the Top of Hill Terrace was a very fancy place, uh, akin to, I suppose, like the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas when Bugsy Siegel opened it. Very nice place. And a lot of celebrities ended up there. Howard Hughes showed up there. A lot of other uh, famous people, whenever they would happen to be in Dallas, that would be the place to go. And Binion gained like a 50% interest in the business. So he had the numbers racket. He had the Top of Hill Terrace. And then he started opening up dice games in the suites of downtown Dallas hotels. The first one he set up was at the Southland Hotel. And then he set up gambling parlors in several more hotels. So this is how he got the nickname. His, his uh, organized crime group got the nickname the Southland Syndicate from the name of the hotel where he had his main operation. Um, and you might say, well, well, what about law enforcement? You know, gambling was illegal in Texas at this time, uh, actually everywhere except Las Vegas or Nevada at that time. Well, gambling, uh, Dallas did not really enforce its gambling laws. Um, it would it would conduct the occasional raid uh, and they would collect bonds on those who were arrested or they would pay fines. And then the gambling would resume. And this was actually a money making racket by the city. And the city, uh, Binion once estimated that the city was receiving upwards of $600,000 a year just on the fines they levied against gambling operations. So 
you know, he was become Binion was a uh, independent, uh, you know, organized crime group. He wasn't tied to any mafia groups directly. He wasn't tied to any other kind of organized crime like Chicago or any others. He was kind of his own man down there. I was going to say, it sounds like, like you say, like he wasn't tied in with the Chicago outfit or Kansas city or, 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 or any of the other groups that would have been active right around that time period. Chicago tried in fact to infiltrate Dallas. They saw Dallas as an opportunity for them around this time in the thirties, but uh, it didn't happen. It, I think it was just not a good call. As you would say today, it's not a good cultural fit for Chicago to come into Dallas and try to uh, try to make some inroads. You had some very powerful and uh, rough characters like Benny Benyon who weren't going to allow that to happen. And I assume too, I mean, you mentioned that, that their law enforcement wasn't all that big on enforcing these laws. I would imagine much like other cities where organized crime was running not rampant per se, but was operating um, law enforcement was probably in the pocket of of a guy like Benny Binion to a degree. Binion uh, was famous and unapologetic, frankly, almost his entire life about paying off politicians, paying off judges, paying off police and prosecutors. He and he would say, you know, these were his friends. Right. And they and they were they treated him like a friend, but it was mostly motivated by money. And uh, Benny was not uh, shy about passing around money to those he thought could be useful to him. There's no question. And if I'm mistaken or not mistaken, I should say in some of the research that I did, it was sort of those payoffs or the inability to be able to pay people off that led him to make the move to Vegas, was it not? Yeah. So for about 10 years, you know, Benny was on top of the Dallas underworld. You know, he was the biggest man in Dallas. But in 1946, and keep in mind the timing of 1946, this is right after World War II, and there is a great movement really across the country to clean up the vice across America, in most of American cities. You saw this in California during the war, and, and in the late 30s, early 40s, you saw a movement that ended up pushing a lot of the gambling uh, operators in LA to Las Vegas during that time. Well, the same thing happened to Dallas. In 1946, a new sheriff was elected and he promises to clean up vice in Dallas. And there was a new district attorney too. And, you know, basically at this point, Benny was a marked man. He, uh, they had, they were just, they were going to get Benny. And he recognized this. He said as much in one interview, he said, this arrangement has done played out. That was Benny's quote. <laughs> uh, so Benny decided at that point to move to Las Vegas to get a fresh start. And uh, he had other guys, some of his partners who had already ventured out to Las Vegas and they had invested in some of the casinos. So he he had heard good things about this, this place. And now it was a place where he might be able to operate more freely. So he literally piled a million dollars in cash into the trunk of, trunk of his Cadillac and then two of his security guards, two of his enforcers, drove with him to Las Vegas. That's amazing. And, and so, of course, Benny gets to Vegas and he decides, I'm going to get into the, the casino business yep. while I'm there. And his early involvement, he it was the Las Vegas Club and the Westerner, correct? Yeah. So the, the first place he stopped was the Las Vegas Club. And this was on Fremont Street. Not a big place, but, you know, it did good business. And at this point, this is where you see the first signs of Benny's uh, wisdom as a casino operator. He increased the betting limits, you know, to allow people to bet bigger amounts. Uh, he also increased the pay for the dealers. He wanted these dealers to be honest and he wanted them to be loyal. And so he did a couple of things at the Las Vegas Club that were very smart and that would become part of his, you know, part of his MO going forward. Um, things didn't last at the Las Vegas Club for too long. Because the, uh, the his other partners decided to move the bill, move the club across the street uh, on the other side of Fremont, and at that point they uh, kind of pushed Benny out of that operation. So a, a year or two later, Benny got involved with the Westerner. Westerner, not a very famous casino in Las Vegas, but it was operating in 1949, and Benny got involved. But in this case, Benny 
did not get along, did not see eye to eye with his partners. The partners, Benny was used to being the boss. And at the Westerner, he couldn't be the, you know, the, the one person making all the decisions. So he ended up uh, dropping out of the Westerner. And then he went in search of his own casino. Enter the horseshoe. Yes. <laughs> so in 1951, Benny buys the shuttered El Dorado Club. So the El Dorado Club was a place that had had a couple different names on Fremont Street, uh, but it had been closed. And it was Benny's opportunity to buy it cheap because it was closed. So he buys the El Dorado Club. And then uh, above and adjacent to the El Dorado Club is the Apache Hotel. It's in the same building. And he leases the building. So he's now got the Apache Hotel and he has the El Dorado Club. And Benny renames this the Binion's Horseshoe. The Horseshoe. And uh, he goes to the gaming board. He's like fully expecting to... Uh, be granted a, a gaming license, and he is rejected. They're like, "No, you're a you're a racketeer and a gangster from Dallas. We don't want anything to do with you." So what Benny ends up doing is he brings in another person, a, a beard or a front man, uh, Doctor Monty Bernstein, and Monty Bernstein is someone who, uh, you know, he was a big gambler, uh, so that's how he knew Benny. Uh, but he's the person who has put up. To put to get the the license for to run the Binion's Horseshoe, and at that point, ben, Benny had a pretty interesting title. His his title was bar and restaurant manager, <laughs> and um, so that's how Benny really ran the uh, Horseshoe at first. Uh, but ben, Binion was absolutely committed to getting his license, and so he starts handing out money, bribes, if you will, to officials, uh, government officials. Um, and he also develops a friendship with a man named Senator Pat McCarran. Pat McCarran was the most powerful politician in Nevada, and he was very supportive of the growth of the gambling industry, no matter who was running it, the casinos. And between that and that, uh, and Benny's, Benny's efforts to gain favor in the state, in De on December 1st, 1951, he got his license, his gaming license. There was a tax commission hearing at the, the federal building on Stewart Avenue. If that sounds familiar, that's because that's the Mob Museum building today. Right. And uh, Benny uh, put on a show. He, <laughs> boy, he said some interesting things. They asked him about the murders. They asked him about different criminal things he was involved in. And Benny was just an aw shucks, make, you know, making everybody laugh kind of guy. And um, then there were others who testified on his behalf as well. So he ended up getting the license on a unanimous vote. So at that point, Benny now, you know, is able to run the casino the way he wants and with his name on it. And, you know, he brought in, he introduced a bunch of innovations uh, to the casino. And one of the first things he did was he put carpet in the casino in downtown Las Vegas. He was really the first one to do that. Uh, and that was the places on Fremont Street were kind of known as the sawdust joints, right? The sawdust meaning these were places that didn't have carpet, but they were, they were, you could, you know, uh, they were kind of a mess is what they were. They were very rustic. And so Benny knew from his experience with the high-end place he had in Dallas that if you put carpet in there and make it into a nice luxurious place that people will appreciate that. Another thing he did is he offered high table limits. So this was risky because, you know, if you if people win a lot, you've got to pay out. You've got to be prepared to pay out. But uh, Benny was not too worried about that. So he he thought that if you have high limits, people are more likely to gamble more, of course. And you're also going to attract more people who can afford to bet more. And that's exactly what happened. The um, you know, a horseshoe became the place to go to gamble, even though it was downtown. If you were a serious gambler. That's where you would go. Yeah, some of the stories that I read about the 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 bets that were placed at the horseshoe in some of those early days were pretty fascinating because it was people that were walking in and sitting down at the blackjack table with a hundred thousand dollars, and and his whole rule was, I don't care how much you're betting as long as you're betting was was kind of the feeling that I got. No, I think that's absolutely right, and and, and you know I think Benny had sort of the the way to get money. Like if he did have to pay out, he could figure out how to pay out. Some of these other gambling operators probably didn't have that kind of money. They didn't have access to the money that he had. 
So to be fair, he was in a better position to offer these high limits than some of the other small casinos. But I mean, it was smart. It, it, it was a marketing, you know, work of genius. And it really is kind of silly to think that something as small as putting carpet in the casinos is such a, a huge innovation. I mean, we've talked before about Bugsy Siegel and the Flamingo and how air conditioning in the hotel was such a huge, a huge yeah. advertising thing for, for Benny Binion to say, I'm putting carpet in and have it be like, okay. <laughs> and for that person to have been that innovative, for that to be Benny, who spent most of his time on horses out in ranches, uh, is pretty interesting, right? There were all these urbane, uh, you know, business entrepreneurs who had these other casinos and they didn't think of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was Benny who uh, who had learned from his experience that that's the thing to do. Something else that I read too about his innovations was he was one of the first, or if not the first, to offer comp drinks to people yeah. other than the high rollers. I mean, it, it's pretty common standard now. You sit down at a casino, you put some cash in a slot machine, and you've got a server that comes over to you and says, would you like something to drink? But at that time, that was not a thing. No, you're right. And, uh, you know, Benny saw customers as people. He saw them as import, as vital to the success of his business. And he saw the opportunities that you could, uh, it's like, it's really a small thing in most cases to offer somebody a drink. If you know, they're going to blow four times that amount of money that the drink costs you in the slot machine or on the poker table or whatever. And it was, just, you know, it was common sense to him, but you know, it was something that was very innovative for Las Vegas. And as expected, of course, it did not take very long before things started not being good for Benny. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the legal troubles yeah. that he ran into in Vegas. So one of the things that that uh, Binion had done a great job of developing a positive reputation in Las Vegas, in Nevada. He gave a lot of money to film traffic. He gave money to organizations that needed it. Um, he did all kinds of things that um, that engendered people's goodwill. But he left a very nasty taste in the mouths of the people in Dallas. And they were determined that they were going to take him down. He had operated for, you know, 15 years. And he, by the way, he still had underworld interests in Dallas, even after he came to Las Vegas. And so people there were determined they were going to get Binion. And so in 1952, there was a huge push in Dallas for uh, the IRS to go after Binion. And a grand jury in Dallas indicted Binion. Um, at that point, this was the earliest incarnation of this. And Binion planned to plead no contest and pay a small fine. That was the agreement that had been reached with the, with the attorneys there. However, federal officials, including none other than Director uh, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, got wind of this. And they did not want uh, Binion to just get a slap on the wrist. They wanted him to to, you know, see some real prison time. So that idea, that plan for him to plead no contest and pay a fine was rejected. And by a year later, uh, federal prosecutors had indicted Binion again, and they were ready for trial. They were ready to go to the bat, go again, go to bat to say that Binion had not been paying his taxes in 1948 and 1949. Uh, instead of going through trial, Binion pleaded guilty uh, he agreed to plead guilty to four counts of tax evasion in 1953. And Binion's thought at the time still was he was going to get a fairly lenient sentence, that he was not going to spend a lot of time in prison. But in fact, the judge was not merciful, <laughs> and the judge gave him five years in prison, uh, in Leavenworth prison, by the way. And uh, Benny was absolutely stunned by this. He had young kids at home, a wife. He had an operation, you know, his business operation in Las Vegas. And uh, he was in a very tough spot. Um, he ended up, you know, serving, you know, a good chunk of that five years. Um, and then he had to deal with what was going on with the horseshoe in the meantime. It's always the tax evasion with these guys, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> if they, I feel like they, they, if they just paid their taxes, 
<laughs> well, another person who you thought you would have thought was really smart about taxes, Frank Costello of New York, he was busted for tax evasion about the same time as Benny. And uh, and uh, his story played out about the same period of time with Benny. Frank Costello didn't serve as long of a, of a sentence, though. So while Benny was in prison and then after he came back from from prison, who was running the horseshoe? What was the the situation there? Was it pandemonium and chaos or did it sort of run smooth ish? Well, very wisely, uh, Benny knew he was going to be going off to prison for a little while. He didn't know how long, but he knew he had and he thought figured he'd probably lose his gambling license as well. Well, he came up with a plan, a very clever plan that uh, for someone else to buy the horseshoe with the understanding that when, you know, when Benny was ready again, he would be able to take the reins back uh, and run the horseshoe again. So Benny set up that a guy named Joe W. Brown, he was a gambler from New Orleans. He had a clean record and Brown bought a, uh, a big interest uh, in the horseshoe and then he would run the operation. And if you look at pictures from that period of time, the mid 50s, it doesn't say Binion's Horseshoe on the sign. It says Joe W. Brown's Horseshoe. Really? Um, yeah. So Joe W. Brown was running uh, the horseshoe while Benny was in prison. But another interesting thing was it, that Brown was not the only investor who had a piece of the horseshoe at that time. Other people who had pieces of it included Meyer Lansky, mobster, Doc Stature, mobster. Longy Zwellman and Jerry Catena from New Jersey, both mobsters. And so this was a, a, a connection to, that, uh, to the East Coast, East Coast Syndicate that, you know, Benny had definitely had during this time. In the end, ben, Binion got out in, in 1957, but he did not ultimately buy back the horseshoe until 1964. It's interesting that despite that, I mean... <laughs> It was almost like he was kind of throwing it in the face of the prosecutors and of of the the judge and of J. Edgar Hoover, for that matter, of saying, yeah, you know what, you're going to stick me away for this, but I'm still going to bring in these mobsters to run the place while I'm gone. I think it's, it's almost kind of like the it's a, almost an F.U. to them. <laughs> I, I think there's something there. Uh, I I also think it has a lot to do with how at the time and in, in particular Las Vegas and Nevada were very accepting of these individuals uh, and of Benny. And they were going to let Benny kind of figure this out while he was in prison. It wasn't Nevada officials who put him in prison. It was it was Texas officials. And so, you know, the, they were just eager to help Benny in any way they could here in Nevada. Well, and as you say, too, at, at that time period, it seems like Las Vegas it was um, very tolerable of the the organized crime community and that they knew it was going on they knew what was happening but as long as things were quiet on that front and it wasn't affecting anybody else they were they were okay with it i think there's a lot of truth to that i think there were some people who were paid off frankly i think we know that uh i think too that there was uh, a feeling that you know, there were certain individuals who were grandfathered in. When when Nevada started regulating casinos in the 50s, uh, late 50s, there were certain individuals who were kind of grandfathered in. And it was understood that they had criminal records in the past, but that they were actually, you know, beneficial to the state now. And Benny was one of those, along with Mo Dalitz and a few others. Benny left quite the the lasting impression on Las Vegas in, in many ways, not just the fact that, you know, the horseshoe, the horseshoe name and, and Binion's and those names continue today. And we'll get to that shortly here, but there were a couple of, of big things that he really did in the city. And that was of course the world series of poker and something I didn't realize that he was so heavily involved with was, was NFR national finals rodeo. Right. Well, the world series of poker uh, was something, it was an idea that Benny uh, had after he uh, saw a poker tournament going on in Reno. And he thought, you know what? What if we brought the best poker players in the world in all together to play a tournament? And uh, they called it the World Series of Poker. And the first one happened in 1970 at Binion's Horseshoe. And it was Benny's idea. 
uh, and or it was a combination of Benny and a couple people. But the idea was that you know he would be sort of the master of ceremonies of this thing, and they would bring in all these sort of famous and infamous gamblers, and that's exactly what happened. And it, all it did was add to the mystique of Benny's Horseshoe. This is the place where if you were a knowledgeable, serious gambler, this is where you would go to gamble. And uh, that's exactly what happened. And the World Series of Poker grew phenomenally during Binion's term, but then it expanded, as you, you know, it's expanded way beyond its original uh, its original expectations now. It's an international phenomenon now. Um, as for the National Finals Rodeo, that was being held every year in Oklahoma and uh, in Tulsa, I believe. And uh, Benny had the idea that it would be great if the National Finals Rodeo was happening in Las Vegas. And he basically convinced the folks at the National Finals Rodeo to bring it to Las Vegas. He made a big you know, contribution, financial contribution to make this happen. But it was him because of his reputation as a cowboy and you know, the fact that he had, you know, he fit into that whole mindset. He wasn't some Bugsy Siegel city slicker type coming to them. He was a cowboy of, you know, who had a huge ranch in Montana. Everybody knew him in that world. And when he convinced them to come to Las Vegas, that was, it was classic Benny, you know, that he was able to do that. And I read as well that he paid entry fees for the Cowboys into NFR, which uh, again is, is kind of an amazing story. It is. He, uh, you know, Benny was very generous person. You know, that's one thing that often happens with uh, Las Vegas uh, mobsters, if you will, guys who came here as mobsters and kind of became civil, civic leaders. You know, another one is Mo Dalitz. He gave many, many dollars to different nonprofits and he built churches and synagogues and, and hospitals. And Benny was similar. He gave money to all kinds of organizations. He also gave money to people. And, um, you know, he just was very generous that way. He had the money. He didn't have a lot of uses for it, except for his ranch up in Montana. So, you know, he was more than happy to give it away. And he did this and he wanted to help people. He genuinely thought, the, you know, it'd be so great if these riders were able to come in for free. So, you know, that's definitely, uh, definitely part of his, uh, part of his MO. Now, one of the stories that I wanted to take a little bit of a side trip on that I, I found was an interesting one. And this sort of goes to the, maybe the not so nice side of Benny Binion was his encounter with a, a, a guy by the name of Herbert Noble, AKA the cat. Yeah. And, and I thought you'd be the guy to ask about this because there's, there really is kind of a, a, a really weird and interesting backstory on this one. This the story of, of Benny Binion versus Herbert Noble is probably, I will say this, probably my favorite story, my favorite mob story. And I've, I've done a lot of research on the mob over the years. And I think this is my single favorite story, not because it's a, it's a, it's got a great ending. It has a horrible ending, but just the the, the sheer um, drama of this story. So you know, Herbert Noble um, was a, started out as a bodyguard for a man named Sam Murray, and Sam Murray was uh, one of the biggest gambling operators in Dallas. Uh, and you'll recall that uh, Binion had had sort of taken the reins after his mentor had died. Well, when Sam Murray died, Noble kind of filled the void. Um, but even when Noble was filling the void for Sam Murray and building his little gambling empire, he was still paying a kickback to Binion on all of his operations. And Binion initially was uh, was asking for a 25% kickback on his gambling, uh, on Noble's gambling. Well, then later, no, uh, Binion demanded 40%. <laughs> and Noble thought this was too much. Noble mm -hmm. was going to stand his ground and that's, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to pay you 40% of my proceeds. Needless to say, these men did not get along. What ensued was a, I guess, six-year battle between Noble and Binion over one trying to kill the other and using all kinds of different individuals uh, to do this. So the first ever attempt on, on Noble's life was in 1946, 
and Noble was shot. He was hit, but he was not killed. In retaliation, Noble did have one of Binion's enforcers killed, a guy named Bob Minyard. 1946 still, on second attempt to kill Noble fails. In 1948, there's a third attempt. This time, uh, Noble is hit in the arm and in the wrist, but he escapes, you know, he's not killed. And so you start to wonder, okay, why did people call Herbert Noble the cat? Well, they're saying, well, he had nine lives. Right? Yeah. They keep uh, trying to kill the guy and he keeps surviving. So this actually continues. The fourth attempt occurs in 1949. Uh, they tried to blow up Noble's car. Well, he managed to thwart that attack. Um, then in that same year, there's a fifth attempt. Noble is shot in the leg, but he gets away. And then something really, really horrible happens. In that same year, 1949, there is a sixth attempt to kill Herbert Noble. But here's the thing. They put a bomb in uh, his car. But that day, when the bomb was in his in his car, Noble wanted to drive his wife's car to go into town. So Noble is driving his wife's car, and then she starts his car to go somewhere, and it blows up, and it kills his wife, Mildred. Horrible situation. Innocent victim is killed, and uh, there are like 700 people who come to her funeral. And not that she knew 700 people, but those people were so so uh, heartbroken about this this poor woman being killed in this ongoing you know gun battle between noble and binion and bomb battle i should say <laughs> um herbert was deeply affected by his wife's death he kind of went crazy with paranoia he was really freaked out so noble then tries to kill one of binion's uh you know hitmen a guy named rd matthews uh, matthews by the way later came to las vegas with binion and um, and was kind of a big player at the at the horseshoe. But Matthews actually lost an eye uh, in that attempt on his life, but he did not die. Noble then tries to kill another one of uh, Binion's uh, hitmen, a guy named Lois Green, and he successfully kills him. And keep in mind, when I say Noble killed him, if you or Binion killed somebody, in this case, they're always working through intermediaries. There's always someone else that right. he's actually doing the deed. Then we come to the seventh attempt on Noble's life. New Year's Eve, 1949. There is a, a an attempt on Noble. He's uh, gunshots are hit. He's hit in the arm and he's hit in the hip, which uh, the bullet lodged very close to his spine. So there's a very long recovery uh, for Noble. And he's in the hospital for several months. In 1950, that's when the eighth attempt on Noble happens. He, Noble is in the hospital at the time, and gunshots ring out, enter the window of his room at the hospital. And uh, fortunately, Noble is able to duck down below his bed, and he's able to avoid being hit. It's just it's just the stuff keeps coming. And uh, just this really incompetent hitman, it appears. <laughs> uh, at this point, there is an effort by Davy Berman, who is the one of the main guys at the Flamingo Hotel uh, at that time, a mob guy. And he wants, there's a lot of publicity about these attempts on Noble's life and some of these other murders. And Davy Berman wants to make a peace settlement between the two. And he convinces Binion and Noble to talk to each other on the phone. Um, unfortunately, they exchanged pleasantries, but they really didn't agree to anything. And, and Noble is only enraged further by this. At this point, Noble, who is a pilot and he has airplanes, he has got a plan where he is he's equipped these two bombs to his airplane. And his plan is he's going to fly to Las Vegas and he's going to drop these bombs on Benny's house. <laughs> now, for a variety of reasons, that plan was interrupted uh, and it did not happen. But Benny heard about it and uh, Benny was enraged by this. He actually sent his family away to California for a period of time because he was concerned that Noble was really going to do this. Well, we're still in 1950. There's a ninth attempt on Noble's life. He does not hurt. In the 10th attempt, there's another attempt. They want to uh, get him in his airplane. So uh, Noble starts his airplane and the engine of the airplane explodes. But for whatever reason, because he's a cat, I guess, 
uh, Herbert Noble is not hurt in this attempt. There was a some kind of metal uh, shield on the engine between the engine and him, and he was protected. And he did not uh, was not killed in that attempt. Um, there's yet another attempt uh, to blow up another Herbert Noble plane that year, 1951. So now we're at 11, 11 attempts and no success. Wow. But I guess the 12th time is the charm. <laughs> so <laughs> the 12th attempt on, on um, uh, Herbert's life is in 1951. And these guys working, we believe, for Binion, buried a bomb beneath Herbert Noble's mailbox. And Noble lived on a big ranch in Texas. And so his mailbox is about a quarter of a mile away from him. So he gets in his car. He drives to the mailbox. He stops the car right on top of the buried bomb. Somebody hiding nearby triggers the bomb. And Noble's body is blown to pieces. It was unrecognizable. The car and the uh, and the body were just, just uh, decimated by this. So at long last, you know, Whoever was trying to kill Herbert Noble, presumably Benny Binion, uh, was successful out on the 12th attempt. And, and of course, you say presumably it was Benny Binion because it, it's never it's never been proven that Binion was involved with this. Certainly never been proven. He was never prosecuted. It was never tried. Uh, but it's kind of one of those things where everybody believed it, including Herbert Noble including investigators in Dallas, including uh, the federal officials. Everybody believed that people connected to Binion were involved with the murder attempts on Noble. And it makes sense because the guys were at loggerheads this whole time. And Noble himself was trying to kill Binion. So it was kind of going back and forth. The fact that it took 12 times, though. I mean, I, I can I can see why this is your favorite story in mob lore, because I all the stories that I've read and all the stories you've shared with me, I don't think it's ever taken anybody 12 times to, to kill someone. No. And it, it's a lot of incompetence there. I mean, that's actually a little bit disturbing. Right. And, and that's kind of what I think Benny suggested this at one point in an interview, he said, you know, if it were me, I would have got it done the first time, <laughs> you know, that was his, his way of, uh, of avoiding uh, any admittal of what had happened. Um, it's possible that of the 12 attempts, some of them, you know, Benny may not have been involved with the planning. He may not have. He kind of just sent out the word. I want, you know, Herbert Noble killed. And some of these guys freelanced it, you know. But uh, I, I and that's what happened. I, I believe Benny was behind it in one way or another. And uh, he finally got his man. Unbelievable. So Benny Binion passing away. Um when when did Benny pass away? And he didn't he didn't go out in a blaze of glory the way Herbert Noble did. Um, when and how did did Benny Binion pass away? Yeah, so Benny, I remember this. Uh, I was working at the Las Vegas Sun newspaper at the time. Uh, he died of natural causes, basically heart failure, on Christmas Day in 1989. And 1989 was actually a big year for for this. Uh, Benny Binion died that year. Hank Greenspun died that year, the Las Vegas Sun editor, and also Mo Daylight. So all these like really big figures in Las Vegas history uh, all died that year. Uh, Benny was 85 years old when he died. Um, so after he died, um, his Jack, his son Jack, had been running the business long before. Um, in fact, since really since 1964, Jack had been running Binion's Horseshoe Club. Uh, so he continued to do that. But then after Teddy Jane died, that was Benny's wife, uh, Teddy Jane, when she died in 1994, then there became a family struggle over the Binion's Horseshoe Club. And in the end, Becky, the younger daughter, she bought out her siblings and took over Binion's. Sadly, uh, Becky was not a, uh, a, a very successful casino operator and the horseshoe started declining rapidly at that point. Yeah, I, I, from what I had read in the the bits of research that I did into that time, that was a, a very um, rough time for for the horseshoe, and that there was there were loans that were made, and there was money that was handed out, and and it didn't it, it was not a good time for for the horseshoe. It would have made a lot more sense for Jack Minion to uh, to run it. He was 
even to this day, he's still alive. He's known as a, a greatly admired casino operator. And uh, for whatever reasons, I can't explain, you know, the siblings fought over this and Becky ended up winning. Now, what Jack did is he ended up moving, operating casinos in uh, Mississippi and other places. And was, to this day, uh, he's still a very successful having his hand in more semi-retired now, but still very successful while Becky ended up selling uh, Binion's in 2004. She sold it to Harris. Uh, and Harris, what Harris really wanted was the World Series of Poker. <laughs> and Harris became Caesars, of course. And um, so Harris uh, then turned around and sold the downtown casino, the Binion's Horseshoe, to the MTR group. I don't know who the MTR group was, but they ran it for a while. And then they sold it to the current owner, which is TLC Casino Enterprises. And they run uh, the Binion's Horseshoe now as just Binion's. So they have the Binion's name, but Harris has the Horseshoe brand. And one of the big, big things that just happened uh, this year is Caesars Entertainment uh, rebranded one of its hotels on the Strip as the Horseshoe. That had been Bally's. Bally's uh, became the Horseshoe. And they had a big celebration. And Jack Binion was, a, was in attendance for the ceremony when they, you know, debuted the new signage. Yeah, it's been kind of fascinating to to see the transition of Bally's into Horseshoe and some of the they they went. I, I remember when they announced that last year, eighteen months ago, somewhere around there, and they had said, I mean, they were going hardcore after that that heritage and that um, history associated with the Horseshoe name. They they really wanted that, and it's been kind of fascinating to see them pull that in, particularly bringing World Series of Poker into that venue from from the Rio where it's been for so long. Uh, that's right. And, um, and, and Caesars has been using the horseshoe brand actually outside of Las Vegas for a number of years. They have uh, horseshoe casinos all over the country. So you mentioned what Jack is up to now. Are there other members of the Binion family that are involved in um, casino ownership or, or anything at all like that? I don't think so, unless you know something I don't. <laughs> now, Jack uh, Jack most uh, recently was serving as chairman of Wind Resorts. Pretty big deal. Uh, he stepped down from that uh, uh, recently, but then he continues to serve as a consultant uh, in his semi-retirement. As for Becky Binion, she, Bainin, Becky Bainin Binion, she's been out of the casino business, I believe, since 2004, I think she's still got a lot of friends and you know, old old Vegas friends here. I know she's still active in the community, but I don't believe she's running any casinos. And of course, Ted Binion, um, sad story and a very bizarre, odd story, which at some point I want to have you back on to get into because Ted, based on what I read, as I got deeper down the rabbit hole with the Ted Binion story, he deserves a podcast episode all of his own because of the the situation. So we'll, we'll get into that at some point down the line. Um, mm -hmm. Has the Binion story ever been dramatized at all for TV or movies? Because I feel like it's it's ripe for a for a a blockbuster film. Well, that, I I agree with you. I will say first that there are two excellent books uh, out there about Benny Binion. There's one called Blood Aces uh, by Doug J. Swanson. Now, Doug Swanson was a journalist in Dallas, and he. He uh, wrote a terrific book called Blood Aces, which really chronicles Binion's career, his life from birth all the way uh, to the rise of the World Series of Poker and everything else. There's another very good book uh, by Gar a man named Gary Sleeper called I'll Do My Own Damn Killing. And it was it came out before Blood Aces, and it is a biography of Binion as well, but not so much about the Las Vegas part. It really focuses... Gary focuses more exclusively on his on uh, Benny's Dallas years, and it's very detailed and very good. As far as TV or movies, there was a TV movie, a Lifetime movie in 2008, called Sex and Lies in Sin City. And there were some fairly big actors in that. There was Mina Savari, Matthew Modine, and Marsha Gay Harden are all in that movie. Uh, again, made for TV. Uh, 2008, really before the whole streaming uh, world took off. Um, I will say that in my mind, 
Uh, and by the way, there have also been some movies made about uh, that was about Ted Binion, uh, that the movie I'm referring to, the Lifetime movie. That was about Ted Binion's story, but it deals with a lot of the whole Binion uh, clan as well. But to your point, I don't think a, a great movie has been made about Benny yet. And I think there's a lot of room there for uh, just think about the Herbert Noble story. That could be a movie in itself. Right. I, I feel like uh, like the Binions deserve a a Goodfellas slash casino slash Scorsese treatment, like really in all honesty. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you've got uh, and there are all kinds of ins and outs to the story we didn't get a chance to, to get into. But, you know, Benny had this huge ranch in in Montana. And there's as I understand it, there are stories to be told about that, too, that could are still to be, you know, still to surface. And then there's a lot of stories about the way that uh, he ran the, the horseshoe and about how cheaters were handled. <laughs> uh, they were not handled very kindly uh, there. And there's a whole Ted Binion story and how Ted kind of uh, his drug problem led to his death and about the saga that ensued after that with two trials. And like you said, we'll get into that another time. But there is just so much there that has not been fully explored by Hollywood. Well, I, I don't know if Martin Scorsese listens to this podcast. Uh, I, I sh I'll tag him on Twitter. If he's on Twitter, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I feel like he should be he should be in on this story. Um, Jeff, pleasure, as always, to have you on the podcast and have a conversation about this. And uh, thank you again for, for taking time to jump on. This is, again, you always come with fascinating stuff. And, uh, and I love having you on. So thank you so much. Well, yeah, you know, thank you for having me. I love uh, sharing these stories with people. And, uh, you know, it's a, a lot of these stories are in the Mob Museum. The Benny Binion is not well represented in the museum right now, but he will be eventually. And uh, it's just one of many great stories in this uh, genre. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode of Jeff Does Vegas. If you've got feedback on this episode of the show, or any other episode for that matter, or you've got suggestions and ideas for topics you'd like me to cover on the podcast, please feel free to reach out to me via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Jeff Does Vegas. Or drop me an email directly at Jeff at JeffDoesVegas.com. In the meantime, thank you so much for checking out the show. Be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll know the moment new episodes are available. And don't forget to visit JeffDoesVegas.com for past episodes and show notes. My name is Jeff, and this has been Jeff Does Vegas, a Walker New Media production.